And I, I think my, my, my talk follows on quite nicely from, um, from, from Paul's. Um, I'm going to try and think with you about what we might be able to learn for immunotherapy from what's going on in the cancer tissue. So recognizing that we don't really know what to do to make patients with ocular melanoma better. And, and what we can do to make the cancer not come back and prevent it from relapsing. And once that's happened, what the best strategy option is. I would like to stand back a little bit and look at this puzzle from my persp particular perspective. So I'm a medical oncologist, so I look after patients with cancer in the clinic, but I'm also running a lab in, in which we're trying to understand how the immune, human immune system interacts with cancer cells. And so all my academic is about trying to tweak out uh, whether immune cells can see cancer and what buttons we should try and push in order for that to be useful for the patient. Um, and I have no data on, on um, ocular melanoma, but Sarah will uh, present some of the data that, that she has um, uh, generated and that was just been published in a, in a very prestigious journal. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the general principles and then would very much like to engage with you in a conversation about what that might mean for, for patients. Um, so, so let me give this a go and then I'll take your questions at the end. So from a clinical perspective, cancer immunotherapy is here to stay. Uh, we know that if we use these drugs, anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and ipilimumab, that we make some patients better. And uh, Paul has uh, identified the data in melanoma, single agent, about 25% of patients live long term. And yesterday I've discharged my first patient from clinic, um, telling her that, well, she probably didn't need any more oncology input. She was one of the first persons that we treated with metastatic metastatic skin cancer, metastatic melanoma, um, when, this, when ipilimumab first became available and she's been disease free for, well, four years now. So clearly drugs that make a big difference to some patients, and, and that is not just melanoma, that's in, in head and neck cancer, that's in, um, in lung cancer, that's in bladder cancer, not all cancers, and uveal melanoma is one of the outliers. And if you use, for example, anti-PD-1, anti-PD ligand-1 antibodies, that's the sort of gold standard immunotherapy that we now have, we hit a globally about a response rate about 20 to 30 percent. When you combine drugs, you cause more side effects, you make the immune system work better, and you make patient people better also. And you get to a roughly 50 percent chance of making people with lung cancer and melanoma better longer term. What we're really poor, though, is at working out who we should treat and who we should not treat and who will just have side effects rather than having benefit. And we know that many people, many companies, many academic institutions and much brighter people than me have tried to solve this puzzle of looking at how we should um, understand uh, who we should treat. And all the attempts that we've had at trying to find things in the blood that would pick up who we should give immunotherapy to have really been pretty unsuccessful. So my, my, my perspective on this, therefore, is that we should look in the tumor tissue. That's where all the events are going on. That's all where all the interface is going to happen. That's where the immune cells need to kill the cancer cells, because that's ultimately what we're after. And so the, my talk is really a journey through that process of thinking, thinking about this puzzle. This whole field is actually really old. If you talk about um, uh, looking at, at immune cells in cancer, then pathologists like Sarah have known for decades, many years, no, Sarah only for about five years, but uh, pathologists have known for many decades that, uh, that immune cells, when there are lots of them in the cancer, that that's good for the patient. But the first group that really took that and made it into something that everybody could really get their head around was this French group led by Jérôme Gallon and uh, Frank Pagès, who, 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 who started counting immune cells in patients with bowel cancer. And they found that these are survival curves, so everybody starts here, and then every time someone dies, the curve goes down a little bit. And what they found is that if you had lots of immune cells in bowel cancer, these patients lived much longer, and if you had few, too, uh, few immune cells, patients did much less well. And this sort of uh, 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 crystallized the concept that the immune cells, even in patients who have cancer, must be trying, because if their number predicts for outcome and their absence predicts for bad outcome, then surely there is a, there's a link between the, the, uh, the, the, the number of the immune cells. And, and 
What has developed over the last, well, this was in 2006, I think, what's uh, developed over the last 10 years is that these data have been reproduced in pretty much any solid tumor that you would wish to, to, uh, to name. And so we, we, I think we are now all agreed that if you've got T cells in your tumor, by and large, that's a good thing for the patient. And here's what this looks like. So here's our cancer cell in the background, sitting there um, on, on, a, on a tissue plate. And here are the T cells, the little round balls that are sitting on the, T, on the tumor cell. And what they do is they make holes in the tumor cell, and they drop little hand grenades into the tumor cells. The hole making makes perforations, perforins. So the molecule is called perforin. And, and the little uh, hand grenades are called granzymes, and they make the cancer cell explode. So ultimately, these guys are, are, are sort of like, uh, like, uh, uh, like, like soldiers. They're ready to rumble, and they now just need to find the right place to release their, uh, their, their, their kit. But tumors are really quite smart. Um, so here's a, a uh, this is a, a lung cancer, actually. So the, the brown stuff is uh, the outlines the membrane of the cancer cells. You see they're sitting here in a nice little nest. And in between those are strands of tumor uh, stroma. So this is where the cancer is not. So there are the blood vessels, the lymph vessels, and all this stuff that holds things together. And the immune cells are these little blue bits that are sitting in the in between the tumor cell nests. And, and the brown bits, the tumor cells, have been stained for a molecule that turns immune cells off. And the molecule that uh, I've stained for, or we've stained for here, is, is a molecule called PD ligand 1. So this is a molecule that, in our normal immune system, limits immune responses. So when you've got the flu, then our old immune cells get really excited, and they, they attack the cells that have been infected with the virus. And when, the, when they've eliminated those, someone needs to tell them to go to sleep again. Otherwise, they go berserk and cause autoimmunity. And so molecules like PD ligand 1 are the inbuilt off switches in our immune system. Cancer is sneaky. So it takes advantage of these pathways. And so what we've seen, what we're seeing here, is that the cancer cells have sort of put on a coat of armor, if you wish, uh, of PD ligand 1, in which the T cells will not be able to attack them. Because the moment they see these cancer cells, they go to sleep and can't eliminate the cancer cells. So this is a sort of um, a, a fight between immune attack and immune, uh, uh, immune escape. And if immune escape or immune suppression um, um, overrules the whole system and dominates, then you, you have a tumor cell growth. And if, in, on the other hand, you manage to release the T cells and get them to do their job, you get tumor control. So, so far, really quite simple, isn't it? And so the question then is, how does this actually work, and what are the players in this? So here's our T cell, and uh, you can see that I, I have a slightly T cell-centric uh, view of the world. It's in, right in the middle, and here are, our, for example, our tumor cells on the outside. And, and it turns out that some of these molecules we already know quite a bit about. So here's our PD-1 molecule, so this is the target for nivolumab or pembrolizumab, and it sort of blocks this interaction between the molecule on the T cells and the tumor cells, because if you flick this switch, in the, if the PD ligand 1 or 2 bind to PD1, that flicks the switch on the T cell and sends them to sleep. So you, you inter interfere with the with switch, you break the switch, or you block the fact that it can be turned on, and then the T cells don't go to sleep or wake up if they have been flicked beforehand. <coughs> And so here's PD-1 uh, as one example, and here's CTLA-4 with its partners. But you can already see that the, the, the whole system has become quite complicated. So there are other molecules that switch T cells off, but equally other partners, parties to the table, that switch T cells on. So this is not just a push one button and everything will run. You probably need to think about multiple buttons, and you need to work out what the buttons might be. And these buttons might very well be different between people, because we all have different immune systems. And indeed, that's sort of what it turns out to be. So the, 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 this is a, uh, it's called a heat map. Um, so pretty intuitive. Cold means little of. Hot means lots of. And each line is a gene. And each row is a patient. So th this to illustrate, this is from patients with head and neck cancer, um, our own data set. And basically, at each patient We've, we've taken the tissue and we've read out which genes the tumor is using and how much of them the tumor is using. And you can see that where the tumors are blue, cold, the genes are not being used very much. These, the, the cells don't cook from those recipes. So imagine it like the gene is like a cookbook. 
um, or recipe in a cookbook, and then you use a copy of that cookbook and take it to your kitchen, and the, the copy of that cookbook that the cell then eventually cooks from to do its job and make its proteins, that is a molecule called RNA. And this can be readily measured in tumor cells. So we're sort of reading out all the stuff that's going on in this tumor all at the same time. And because it's quite complicated, there are lots of genes, 20,000 of them or so in this particular case. We've, we haven't displayed all 20,000, but I've just picked out the ones that I was interested in. And because I'm talking about T cells, I've picked the ones that have to do with T cells. So on the right-hand side, I've given you the name. So CD3 is a molecule that's found in all T cells. CD4 is found on T cells. And, and then there are molecules that have to do with the, the, the bombs that I talked about earlier. So his granzyme and perforin. And then there are some of the molecules that we use to switch T cells off. So here's our PD ligand 1, and here are CTLA4 and PD1, and PD, sorry, PD ligand 2 and PD1. So the takeaway message is lots of genes, but by and large, they're actually co expressed. So if you have a tumor that has, for example, lots of PD1 and T cells, it probably has lots of T cells, and it also has lots of PD ligand 2 and PD ligand 1, and lots of CTLA4, and so on. So I think the message that is emerging in this case in head and neck cancer, but we have very similar data in lung cancer and in melanoma of the skin, in esophageal cancer, and so on, is that the, the, the T cells are actually, by and large, switched on at the same time as lots of other cells also, and that you can start reading this kind of information out. So take a sample from this tumor, run the analysis, and you should be able to see what the T cells or what the immune cells are doing in the tumor. And if you now go back and map this onto clinical outcomes, then this accounts for about 20% of patients. And lo and behold, if you treat patients with relapsed head and neck cancer with anti-PD-1, then about 20% of patients benefit, suggesting that probably the people who are sitting in this group will be the ones that benefit from immunotherapy. So then if we go back one step and now say, well, let's think about this as a concept rather than worry about each individual gene, the prediction would be that the patients who have these tumors here will relapse early and probably won't benefit from PD-1 treatment. And the patients that sit here will relapse late or perhaps not at all. And if they do relapse, they'll benefit from immune checkpoint inhibition or uh, immunotherapy. So it seems kind of intuitive that that's information you would like to gather. And I think that's what we need to do for patients with ocular melanoma, because no such data sets are currently available. So I don't have such data either, and we've been uh, talking with Sarah uh, this morning about how one might go away around generating such data sets. And, and so because I haven't got anything useful in uvular melanoma, I'll show you something in tumors where I do know this information. And we've basically looked at patients with head and neck cancer and lung cancer. And the, the heat map is the same, except that the colors, I apologize, I didn't make, change the colors. The color scheme is different. So in this case, blue is still cold, but yellow is now hot. And, and, and the, 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 the message is, again, we've taken immune cells from normal tissue, lung, and from cancerous tissue in the lung, so lung cancer and head and neck cancer, various flavors thereof. And by and large, these T cells in the lung cancer have genes that are very similarly expressed. So the long and short of this is, if you read out all the genes, if you work out which genes are similar in T cells in lung and in lung cancer, or lung and head and neck cancer, and by extension, lung and melanoma, then you are able to distinguish the features that characterize T cells that are good in the cancer. And you can make this complicated graph into something a little bit more simple and, and, and display all the genes that are differentially expressed in, in, in sort of a ball figure, uh, where each one of these dots is a normal lung tissue, T cells thereof, and a cancer sample. And you can see that they all cluster together. So the T cells actually seem to be really quite similar, irrespective of whether they're sitting in lung cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, melanoma, head and neck cancer. And they look really different from T cells that are not sitting in the cancer tissue. So what I'm saying is there are features, characteristics of the immune cells that, be, that, are, that are present if a T cell, an immune cell in general terms, live in a cancer tissue. So now let's take this information and now read back how that maps onto drugs that we, we can use.
So I have done exactly the same here. So these are, again, each one is a patient. Each role is a gene. But this time, I've picked out the ones that we can do something about. So here's PD-1, TIM-3, LAC-3, CTLA-4, TIGIT, ICOS, CT-27. All of these are targets for which there are now immunostimulatory antibodies or blocking antibodies, depending on what you need. And all of these are in clinical testing. So what you, now, what you now really would like to do, if you were a physician and a patient, is take a sample and, and see whether you fall into this spot or whether you fall into this spot. So here, for example, this patient here, is really unlikely, I think, to respond to an anti-PD-1 antibody because there's nothing there to release. These T cells are not blocked through PD-1. So it makes no sense to give them an antibody that would block that. And basically, the, the message here is between the two groups, this is lung cancer and head and neck cancer, that the features are very well maintained. So now we need to uh, uh, leave our tumor and the T cells and the molecules that they make for a moment because I need to talk to you about T cells and what they do as, for a living. So T cells go traveling. That's the sort of thing they do. So imagine the image that I like to use in my clinic is imagine like a T cell, like a sniffer dog. So the sniffer dog is trained to see, say, cocaine. Um, or cannabis, whatever you want. Um, and, 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 and it goes, patrols the body looking for cocaine just like the dogs at the airport do. And so it sniffs the bags and, 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 and gives a signal if, if cocaine is found. Of course, there isn't, they're not looking for cocaine. They're looking for things that are different to the molecules that they've been trained against. So our, there's a gland in our body called the thymus that educates our T cells. And it allows us to work out what is self to be ignored and what is foreign to be attacked. <laughs> Fits like on Trump, doesn't it? And, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and, and, and so these cells patrol our body and go from A to B. So they come out of the bone marrow, they go to school in the thymus, and then they patrol our body looking for trouble. And so each immune cell is able to recognize particular features. And um, Paul talked about the IMC GP100, and the, the, the counterpart to what the T cells are seeing, the sort of silver plate that our body cells are presenting to the T cells with their sniffer nose, is called the HLA, the human leukocyte antigen molecule. So these are molecules that take bits from the inside of the cell and present it like on a platter to the outside. So, so you can imagine all the cells are sort of going like this, and the T cells are coming along, sniffing it, and if they find something they like, they latch on, and then start attacking that, that cell and remove the cell that is now the offender. So it's a sort of like, kill me please, signal that the, the, the normal cells um, present. And, and the, the difficulty that we've had is that these T cells that are doing this, this killing and this patrolling, they need to go somehow from A to B. So the only place that they can really use to do that is the bloodstream. So in other words, what you would have thought is that if you want to get a T cell that's sitting in your lung cancer or your ocular melanoma, and that needs to go to the liver, it needs to travel from A to B, and hopefully while it's doing the traveling, you'll be able to capture it. So the idea had been that, well, take a bit of blood, see what you find in the blood, and work out what the T cells are doing. But of course, they're all, they're all traveling on the, on the road. So it's like having 100 million cars all on the same road. How are you going to pick out the one car that is the relevant one that carries your right protection? And that really has been the problem, that the sort of what's going on in the blood is confounded by all the other things that our body is doing to protect against um, uh, infection and to keep us in our integrity. It, how, however, turns out that not all T cells travel. Uh, so some of them become resident. They, they sit in a place and live there for the rest of their lifespan, probably many years, actually. And these are called tissue-resident memory cells. So, if they were to play a role, then you would never capture them in the blood because they don't go through the blood. So they, they go to school in the thymus, they, they, they get switched on in the lymph gland, and then they go to the tissue, and then they live there and die there. So they reside in the tissue. Um, so the, um, the, 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 the problem then is that these T cells are only catchable, understandable in the tumor, because if they don't travel, you will never find them anywhere else. And that's sort of the message that is emerging out of this new field studying tissue-resident memory cells. And, and it, it, these cells were first described in the skin, they were found in the bowel, they were found in the lung, and they're now found in, the lung, in, in, in cancer tissue. 
So there's a convenient handle for these, a convenient marker, a flag, if you wish, for these tissue-resident memory cells. So um, I, I've, uh, the, the pathologists always use brown stains uh, because it picks up cells against the, uh, the bluish background. So each time there is a brown stain, there's a cell that makes something that we are staining for. So here we're counting the affected T cells, cytotoxic T cells. Here we're looking at which ones of these are potentially switch-offable through PD-1. So these are PD-1-positive T cells. And here's this molecule called CD103, which is this tissue homing mo molecule. So it makes the cells stick in the tissue and live in the tissue. So it's the key marker for tissue residency. And you, you can see that if you've got lots of T cells, you've got lots of them, the ones that make PD-1 and lots of them that make CD103. And conversely, if you have few T cells, they also don't make a lot of PD-1 and they don't, also don't make a lot of CD103. And in, in lung cancer, that is really striking. So if you now take tumors that have lots of T cells, all of which we think should be doing well, then if you look at those patients who have lots of these tissue-resident T cells, then their survival is really good. And if you don't have those, you're, you're much more likely to die. And so this is now suggesting that it's not just you have T cells, you have soldiers, but you have soldiers with guns, the people who are doing the doing, that are important, and that you would be able to pick those out. So now if we, now we, if we step back to, uh, from, the, from the tissue resident T cells to, to the protection and prediction. So um, what, what I've done here is um, taking the initial observations that we made in lung cancer and now started looking at what happens in people that you intervene in. Um, so uh, the, 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 the brown dots, each row, uh, sorry, each column is uh, a patient again. Each row is one of the, the molecules that we've looked at before that we can target by immunotherapy. And, and the, the, these ones are the patients from the lung cancer data set I showed you earlier, and the green ones are the patients with, who have recurrent metastatic disease that we've looked at the T cells of. And, and what, we, what you can see is that there's this spectrum from cold, not very much, to hot is maintained, and you can now start mapping individual patients' T cells onto this spectrum. And it's quite instructive. So if you have T cells that look like this, then the immunotherapy works really well. Both of these patients have achieved a complete response. If you have sort of lukewarm T cells, so here's the PD-1, not very much going on in PD-1. Anti-PD-1 didn't really work, made the board stabilize the disease, and the cancer came back. And in this patient, the anti-PD-1 antibody didn't work at all. So it maps really quite nicely. And what we would like to do, or what we are doing now, is prospectively looking at how, how consistent this is. And because this, this technology is really quite complicated, you need a fresh sample, you need to take these cells out, you need to send them away to your favorite laboratory to do this RNA sequencing, we've just started working out whether you could do this in a slightly more uh, convenient method. And what you can, what you can do, and what, what, what I'm showing here, is that if you have your cell, you can stick molecules on it that make them fluoresce, and these are called antibodies. And you can make the antibodies pick up any flavor of uh, feature that you like. So in this case, I've stained the cells for the presence of PD-1 antibody, or rather my technician has. And what you can see here is that most of these immune cells in this particular gentleman, uh, particular lady actually, have lots of PD-1 on their CDA T cells, and they have very little CTLA-4 on their, on their T cells. So the prediction would be if you give this person immunotherapy, anti-PD-1 will work and, um, and CTLA-4 will not work. And this was, uh, data was available on the day after she had her surgery. So this now suddenly becomes information that may become re relevant in terms of time scale to actually making decisions in the clinic. So I think what my, my pledge therefore is, or what, my, uh, what I'm hoping we would do is that this kind of an analysis should be done in patients with uvel melanoma. I think you'd start initially, just like we're doing in, in head, neck, and lung cancer, to just profile what do these tumors look like. And I'll be very interested to hear what, what Sarah thinks about that. I think in our hands, the protection is mainly linked to this particular group of affected T cells called CDA T cells and narrowing it down to these tissue resident ones. So that's where the focus, I think, should be. Then we would, would like to intervene, so for example, give treatment A, B, or C, and then see what has happened as a result. And, and so uh, then use these relatively complicated and hopefully increasingly simpler methods to work out what, what was there before and how that maps onto treatment. 
So for ocular melanoma, clearly the, the, the options are a, a little bit more limited, but what we could do is take the cells that are present at diagnosis, so in the primary tumor, and then compare them to the cells that happen, that, that, that are present, for example, at relapse in the liver or in the skin, and see what changes and what it is about the immune system that is or is not good. And if it, for example, it is really unusual in ocular melanoma, if you've got T cells, lots of T cells in the primary tumor, that seems to be leading to a worse outcome, quite counterintuitively. So I'm really curious why that is, and, and I hope that um, we'll be able to shed some light on that in, in collaboration with, with Sarah. So the, I think, overall take I have is uh, we need to, to, to ask smarter questions. Um, I, I think we need to be driven by the data. We need to generate evidence that compares how is uvul melanoma similar or dis different from other cancers. We need to learn what we're doing in lung cancer and melanoma and apply those lessons in ocular melanoma. But for that, we need data. For that data, we need tissue. For that tissue, we need to ask our patients when they come and present with metastatic disease, can you please make some of that tissue available? Do you allow us to use that for understanding this? And only then, I think, will we be able to make decisions about how we're treating our patients more smartly. So that's where I would like to leave it. It's a big team that's working uh, together with me. Um, so in Southampton, the pathologist, Gareth Thomas, is a key player. Um, some of our surgeons, Eamon Aldetani and um, Emma King. The molecular biology is all driven through a collaboration with the team in La Jolla, VJ and Anpan Rangan in particular. And, and for the surgical collaboration, we have very close links with the team in Liverpool. Uh, we're sort of slowly expanding our reach in head and neck cancer. We're now working with a team in the Mars, and also a, a number of pharma partners are allowing us to access their drugs to, to play with in the clinic to do this kind of window study that we can try and work out what happens from the after compared to the before. And that's where I would like to leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for another really informative and fascinating talk. Um, it's really good to see all the collaborations going on. Um, do, do you and Paul and Mount Vernon have any collaborations? Is, uh, does that we, work? we seek Paul's help when we run out of options. Yeah. So um, Paul has been very helpful in looking after many of our patients, <laughs> for example, for the IMC GP100 study, um, where we unfortunately are not a center. So I think you know, there, this isn't a big enough a group of physicians to not talk to each other. Yeah. So I think, you know, sensible, yes. Having, having that list of names and having you all working together and having access to all the trials um, just so that you didn't have to go to just one or two centres to get whether it's this or IMC. Yes, and I think and to align thoughts also, isn't it? So, yeah. so what, what is the... Uh, what, what, is, what is deliverable, what can be done, who would want yeah. to work on which particular area. Um, so, you know, I'll never be someone who, in, who will develop small molecules uh, because my heart just is in immunology. Yeah. But you know, I'm pretty good at that, so I can bring that to the table. So, questions, please. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to declare an interest because I'm going to go into the tills that Professor Hawkins is running. From what you're saying here... Oh, from what you're saying here, the tills in the, the normal part of your body are different from the tills in the tumour, which is what this process... Um, but if the tills in the cancer tumour itself are not doing their job, does that not mean that they're inefficient? So you've laid your finger on the very heart of the problem of cancer immunotherapy. Yes is the answer, and no is the answer also. Um, so the yes bit is, if there are T cells in the tumor, it says that the immune system can see the cancer. So if you make these T cells supercharged, for so example, by expanding them a million fold outside of the body, and then giving them all the stuff that they need to become really aggressive bastards, so IL-2, then there's a really good chance that these T cells will actually go and do their job. So the problem is that they don't always. So in the data sets for TIL therapy, globally, roughly 40% of patients benefit. So there must be some TILs that are crap and some that are excellent. And we don't know, and we don't know that. 
So at the moment, and like in many other things in medicine, we suck it and see. We give the tells, we expand them. So that's the first step. And then you can give them back and see whether it's worked. What I'm proposing here is that you can read out those differences. So the systematic study of what the tills are made up of, out of, and they're not like identical twins. They're more like a pupil set of pupils in a school. You know, all of them are different, and they see different things. That is the big puzzle that is currently um, 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 to be resolved. So what we do know is if you have tills, and if they're blocked through PD-1, then releasing them is highly effective. If you have T cells that are not blocked through that pathway, then anti PD1 won't work. And I think those data are now emerging. So the question is then can you push other buttons? And, 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 and if you stand back from what I've just um, said, can you work out why the T cells are not in the tumor in the first instance? So when we look at, we've done this on about 100 patients now. So if you look at the tumors that come out of the patient at surgery, in nine, just over nine out of 10 patients, we can get enough immune cells to phenotype, to characterize. So that means in nine out of 10 patients, there are T cells in those tumors. But it turns out that that probably makes a difference which bit of the tumor they sit in. Um, so th 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 there are some tumors where you get a ring of cancer, so, sorry, a ring of immune cells sitting around the cancer. This seems to be less good than if you get immune cells that are sitting in the cancer where the in the cancer is the sort of picture of they're trying to kill the targets. So those are things that still need to be worked out. Is there a correlation between the ones that sit on the outside and the ones that sit on the inside and the results? <laughs> I don't know. That's a fantastic question. I don't know the answer. So I don't think anyone has really looked. Because for the till therapy, you take the tumor, you mash it all up and you get all the immune cells that are on the outside, on the inside, and you make them and then grow them. What you don't know is which ones are growing either. So if I take immune cells from a T cell, the immune cells from a tumor, and put them in a test tube and grow them, then the, 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 the makeup of those cells after they've been grown is different to the makeup of the cells that come fresh out of the patient. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this like you plant flowers. Uh, apologies, follow me, uh, humor me for all my, 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 my various images. I plant flowers, and some of the bulbs take and some don't. So I think that's what's happening in the, in the till expansion also. Some of the plants grow as the cells divide and, and multiply. They're the ones that you can give back. And some of the ones that don't make it die off, and they don't, are not given back. What we don't know is whether it's always the important ones that make it. And that, I think, is probably contributes to the puzzle why this doesn't always work. Okay, can I have one last question? Uh, down in front here. Yeah, yeah far away. Uh, if you've been tested for another uh, cancer in the past month, if you've been tested for another uh, hereditary cancer with a high probability in the past, and then you get this cancer, can that trigger? Anything else will kick it off? Um, so I think the question probably need to turn on uh, turn it on said. Is there a link between ocular melanoma and other cancers? Is that what you're asking? Oh well, I was, te I was tested ninety six percent chance of getting bowel cancer, and that was before I got this cancer. Would it kick it off and wake it up? Or? I think you're just unlucky. You have got two two <laughs> different. <laughs> You've got uh, two different problems. That I wouldn't think so, no. I think you can be relatively sure, reassured about that. Sarah, do you have any thoughts? Correct. Um, however, you know, that being said, you know, obviously the screening that you're probably undergoing for your bowel cancer should continue, yes, but uh, like Kristen, I don't think it would uh, truly be diagnosed with and treated with the tumor. You know, it doesn't increase your risk of you know, obtaining it. It's not the right to take it from. Yeah. Right. Thank
Thank you. Go on, Paul. Okay, so I'm going to draw this session to a close now. Thank you all very much. I know there's lots more questions, uh, but we do have to um, run to time if we can, I'm afraid. Uh, otherwise, our subsequent speakers will be uh, not having enough time for their talks. So uh, we're going to compress the coffee break because we are running slightly over. Uh, I'd like us still to come back for the next talk at half 11. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, Christian. For, um,